What do you think it is about documentary films as a medium specifically, say over the last decade, that has really become such an impactful tool for educating and informing and inspiring and motivating the public on issues of animal rights and food production, uh, environmental activism, human health? Why documentary films, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, film in general has exploded over the last 10 years with, you know, the rise of YouTube and, and filmmaking equipment, uh, essentially, uh, has become a lot more accessible, I think. And I, I think films have just a way of, of touching people. They have a way of explaining things uh, that really touch people in a different way than, than maybe a book. You know, it's, it's not as many people are going to sit down and read the China study that are as they're going to watch, watch the health. It's a bit easier to watch, watch the health <laughs> than get through the, the China study or Veducated or, or other films. And, um, and, and I think they're becoming better and better produced over the years. I think if you probably went back to like pre, you know, 2010, there's probably some, some films out there that, that are similar, but maybe not as good as quality, not getting the exposure. Uh, and, and then I think people are obviously becoming more aware of vegan issues, plant-based issues, and they're sharing more and it's easier to share, you know, view and share. And, and I think all those things are, are, are catching up. Uh, the quality is becoming better. I think, you know, it's definitely prolific in the animal welfare avenue. That's in the festival. That's the one, the, the category we get the most in. And I think those films are becoming much more digestible for the general public, I think you know, years ago, not even that long ago, all the animal welfare films were all, you know, blood and guts and gore. Mm. And, and now filmmakers are being extremely creative and getting the message of what happens in a slaughterhouse without maybe that blood, guts and gore, and maybe a bit more of a digestible film for your friends and family to see it that, that maybe aren't hardcore vegans. So those that's are some a, thoughts, that's yeah. a really good point. That's a really good, really good point. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Demetrius, your film was sort of on the cusp of exactly what Sean was just talking about, this sort of change uh, in not only quality, but also content of what we were seeing in sort of the, the vegan animal rights world, going from, like you said, the, the blood and guts to sort of these more educated, veducated um, ways of talking about this topic. So what do you think it is about uh, documentaries as a, as a medium for this message? Lots, lots of thoughts there, right? Because it's been, um, it's been ten years for me, actually, just, just this month, uh, since I signed on to Veducated, and Veducated uh, is actually part of that teeter totter that Sean, you're just talking about uh, production values. Um, Marisa, the, the filmmaker, the director, writer, and the unnamed producer, she wanted an activist tool. She had spent a vegan activist tool. She had spent quite a bit of time two decades ago in the knots if I can call it that and so she knew when people saw it that they would relate to it but if they wouldn't watch it right because of the blood bloods guts and gore because people kind of know that's going on they kind of know um, but if she could come from a different angle and use more persuasion versus being provocative that people would start to think ask questions become curious anything in there um, and I think we've achieved that um, many more things to say, but, but let me pause there. I think it was, the provocative was there, right? And not only in, in documentary, but in a lot of uh, sort of pre-social media, really, if you start thinking about PETA and other players. She wanted to come from a persuasive and necessarily use humor, which we still haven't seen as much of as I'd like with the feature length uh, projects, whether documentary or uh, fiction-based. Great. Um, John, I feel like you're kind of um, on the, the other side of that coming into this so recently in terms of your latest project. Maybe you, do you want to talk about what it feels like to be creating a documentary film in this um, vein in 2020? Um, what do you think it is about the documentary film medium today that makes it so impactful? I, I believe, and I've always talked about this, is that documentaries meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we, even, especially as vegans, we get to a certain space and we're like, hey, you all should come over here with us, but we don't go back to lend out a hand and we don't remember that we weren't always vegans. Of course, there's some people that have been vegans since birth, but we forget sometimes that, you know, we might have been that person with a steak sandwich just two weeks ago. You see a lot of, you know, <laughs> you know, you get that. You, you get somebody that just opened up a vegan page, they're angry, they're pissed, they just, they, you know, the, the veil's been taken down and they're all upset and they just want to go, go, go. And then they forget that they used to be that person. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to go back. And that, that's what I think documentaries do. It's like, you can go meet a person back at their house. You know, you got the invite in. You, they don't have to go buy a book. Nobody sees them walk around with this book that says China Study or anything. It's the privacy of their own home. And I think that's what documentaries do. They allow people to be themselves, check out this information. If they actually hated it, they never have to tell anybody it happened. You know, with a book, you know, if you're in a book club, nope, there's no documentary club yet. I say yet because somebody might invent it. There's no documentary club yet where you have to admit, you know, I watched it, but I didn't get what you got out of it. You know, book club is is these all these different things where you have these aspects of, I got this from the book. I got this from the book. It's 20 people around and everybody's admitting that they read it. And once you read something like, you know, like Maya Angelou said, once you know better, you do better. So it's kind of like that sense of there's no pressure on anybody to watch after watching a documentary, you don't necessarily have to change your life. So I think that's why the impact is so important right now is to make a, a film to where after they watch it, even if they don't change, the seed has been planted. And they may get watered down the line and, and somebody else might, you know, they might watch, you know, Vegucated and then they might watch What the Health and then they might watch, you know, they're trying to kill us. So basically they got these three steps. I think a lot of times as vegans, we want to be the one to plant the seed, water the seed, cultivate the seed. We want all the credit. It's like sometimes it's a team effort. And I think that's what uh, documentaries are doing now. That's, with that's everything. an incredible point. That's so true. It's so true. And people can do it in the privacy of their own home without a vegan screaming at them behind them yeah. or something like that. <laughs> I mean, we're screaming on the other side, but we're just like, we, we make it look better. <laughs> it's just the other way. <laughs> they can pause it if they need to. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, so I would love to talk a little bit more specifically about your project. Um, Keegan, I mean, arguably your work, uh, I mean, for me personally, uh, Cowspiracy and What the Health were two of the most profound um, uh, films in, in my journey uh, in becoming vegan. I'd love to hear from you uh, what you think about your projects made them specifically so impactful. Uh, how do you think you reached audiences uh, as well as you did? Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for that. I think that what my co-director Kip Anderson and I did with those films is we tried to make it as funny as possible, um, wherever possible. You know, obviously we're dealing with very heavy subject matters, but if you can, you know, as Demetrius said, like inject a little bit more humor into a project, it, it lightens the mood and makes it more digestible for an audience. Um, and then, you know, we, we tried to go as high quality as we possibly could. You know, there's a lot of really incredible documentaries out there from well-intentioned activists, but who aren't necessarily filmmakers. And so the production quality isn't always the highest. And so we're already trying to get an audience to watch, you know, an unpopular subject matter. Yeah. We might as well make it as you know beautiful as possible. And I think Liz Marshall has, you know, excelled at that. I mean, anyone who's seen Ghost is, will just be amazed at the, the quality of filmmaking. Um, and so that's very much, you know, what we tried to do with Cowspiracy and What the Health. And then the success, I think, was also just the right time and place is that, you know, Netflix picked it up. It's a time when people are digesting films in, in a you know mass way versus where you used to always have to have a major studio behind you. You had to have a successful theatrical run. And so I think it's just you know, time and place. People are waking up and they want the information. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. And, and what you said about Liz is absolutely true. Liz, I'd love to hear um, what your thoughts are on what made your your projects so impactful because they absolutely have been. Um, what do you think is the secret to making a documentary film that really engages the public the way that people have with yours? Yeah, hi everyone and uh, hey Keegan, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's many different, uh, so from a methodology perspective, I think there's so many different ways we can, we can, tell stories um, and and always you have to come back to what is your motivation, what is your intention, who is my audience. So for ghosts, um, I'm going to start with the personal. So when I was making that film, I had my own like extreme kind of dramatic epiphany. And I had been vegetarian, but I was not yet vegan. And so the whole vegan ethos is something that I discovered during my process. And I realized that it wasn't a step, it was a leap. And in that leap, I felt that my blinders had been removed 
And I wanted to create a film that could have that experience for people so that they wouldn't uh, look away, they wouldn't turn away, but rather that they would engage with something that is so profoundly complex. And it was on the, the heels of Blackfish. So we had this, you know, Blackfish, of course, you know, the hashtag Blackfish effect um, had this enormous impact um, about a single issue, you know, about something that's a no-brainer for the vast majority to rally behind and get behind. And it did have that impact. It impacted, you know, SeaWorld at the shareholder level. Um, so there was a direct call to action with that film that made it very sort of, you know, practical for viewers to get behind. Whereas with The Ghost in Our Machine, it's more complex. It's more about, hey, you know, we care about our companion animals, we care about wildlife. Let's also care about these invisible um, industries and animals, the billions of animals that are hidden from our view. And this is a moral issue. And how can we reach people at, at you know, sort of, how can, we, how can we reach beyond the core audience? Although the core audience is pivotal and in, incredibly important to any campaign. How can we reach beyond though and get into the living rooms of people around the globe who have a heart, who have a moral conscience, because I believe that most people do. And how can we appeal to them and touch their heart and open their mind? And so for me, it comes back to that question. And so for me as a filmmaker who has been making, you know, human rights, environmental rights, and now animal rights films, because they're all equally important to me, um, it was all about, okay, let's humanize this. So for, you know, the style of filmmaking that I embrace, it's, it's character driven. So in other words, you know, focus on an individual, on a human that can anchor the experience for a broad audience and allow that to be the entry point to um, hopefully, you know, the, you know, a very wide global audience can um, relate and feel empathy for that main subject, for that main character in your film, and then take people on a journey. So yeah, it's true, my films don't really have um, a sense of humor. <laughs> um, there is more of that gravitas and kind of haunting, like the ghost in our machine is very haunting. <clears throat> but at the same time, it's considered to be, you know, um, like a gentle approach in removing people's blinders, but you have to stick with it. You have to watch the whole film. And by the end of the film, it has a dramatic effect. You know, that's the feedback that we had. And we actually conducted a formal impact evaluation and we wrote a formal impact report um, that was funded by the Dog Society back in 2015. And that was a really, really, really um, useful um, uh, exercise because it allowed us to actually gauge uh, the metrics from a qualitative and quantitative perspective to see how the film was moving in the world and how it was actually affecting um, social consciousness and behavioral change. But I think Keegan's films have been able to be sort of like a tsunami in terms of impacting behavioral change. Um, whereas I think the ghosts in our machine has taken a different approach to impact. Um, I think it's more of a consciousness raising um, film.